And welcome to this episode of the Good Citizen Podcast. Great to have back on the podcast, Senator John Crane, also known as Gene's husband. And that if you listen to the interview on mental health, Gene was a part, it was a fantastic conversation about how uh, the church can impact mental health. Uh, we had kind of that running joke going on. But no, Senator Crane, grateful to have you back on. Uh, Senator Thank Crane, you. Repre yeah, Thank represent you. It's great to be with you. Absolutely. Uh, Senator Crane represents District 24, which is going to be west of Indianapolis and has a number of, of different things or ministries that he pursues. Former pastor, leads the Sagamore uh, Leadership Initiative. Uh, that's a, a ministry working on worldview for, for young adults and for students, and also is a board member on the Colson Center uh, for Christian Worldview. So I want to, to jump in, just get a little bit of an update. Uh, those that are longtime listeners are familiar with you. Uh, we talked a little bit about religious liberty once, and we had a great conversation on engaging Gen Z. Uh, now coming back to talk about the art of political persuasion. But if you would, just give us a brief update uh, for you, maybe personally, professionally, how are you doing? Yeah, well, it's great to be with you, Josh, as always. And I always love getting on your podcast uh, because... Obviously, the things that you're talking about are really, really important. I know all your listeners are engaged on things that really matter. And of course, uh, we're in very serious times. And uh, so it's important for us to be engaged in these things. Uh, yeah, there's a, there's a lot happening um, on all fronts in the, in the Senate and in the legislature. A lot of different things happening there. And uh, that keeps all of us very busy. We uh, those of us who serve in legislature uh, sometimes fail to read the fine print. It said uh, in the large print that it's a part-time job, but the fine print <laughs> is that it's much more than that, um, depending on how you choose to approach the, the role. And I've been very grateful to be able to serve the constituents, not only in District 24, but all across our great state. And uh, as you mentioned, doing a lot of other things in the area of leadership, um, doing some great stuff with our next-gen leaders and our Sagamore Leadership Initiative. And also doing a lot of speaking and teaching and equipping with adults that are beginning to awaken to recognize, hey, uh, we're all here for such a time as this. And so what do we need to do to get ourselves better equipped and to, to equip our children and our grandchildren? And then uh, I've been privileged over the last couple of years to serve on the National Board of Directors for the Colson Center for Christian Worldview. And uh, I've been involved with that organization for, oh, probably about... 18 to 20 years. Uh, I came through the Colson Fellows Program back in 2004 and uh, have worked with the Colson Center for a, in a number of roles and then have had this privilege of being on the board. And it's just so encouraging to me to be able to be joined by other committed leaders from across our country who recognize what's at stake and are really trying to, to lead in raising up folks to understand the implications of the Christian worldview. So there's a lot happening, but uh, it's great stuff. I get up every day and I'm really excited to be able to get back to get back to work. So, so quick side note before we jump into kind of the meat of the interview, uh, you mentioned that in Indiana, being a legislator is a part-time job, and uh, we one of the the verses that we shared with legislators this year is in First Peter two seventeen. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. And we kind of joked that. Sometimes as a church, we've done a decent job of kind of heckling the king, uh, not so much honoring them. And I would, I would note in, in Indiana, uh, legislators make about 25 grand a year, not 250 grand, uh, about 25 grand a year is per diem. Mm -hmm. And that you have to have other jobs to, to make that work. And so sometimes when I'm talking to pastors, it seems to kind of blow their minds. In fact, I had one pastor look at me and say, well, why do they do that? <laughs> so why do you, you know, serve in a church? And I'm sure you're, yeah. you're not driving around in a Rolls Royce. Um, yeah. It's because you want to be a minister um, and you want to help people. And so just a, a side note, kind of one of my pet peeves and appreciate your, your work there. Yeah, in your thank district. you very much. So as I have I've been working in the Indiana legislature, connecting pastors, government officials, I, I hear all of the time, and this would be across the aisle, by the way, from, from people talking about these four C's of decision-making and that it's, they had this really helpful filter as they're trying to manage all of the pressures of public life. And so where'd, where'd you hear those? And they're like, oh, Senator Crane, he always talks about the, the four C's. Uh, so I, what I wanted to do today is kind of bring this filter for decision-making in a really difficult area in public life. Um, let listeners hear that. 
And I think this is a big part of political persuasion, kind of the art of political persuasion is how you mm -hmm. framed it. Mm -hmm. But I also think these four C's are helpful in other areas, maybe church leadership, uh, business owners as well. And, and so this has been helpful to me, but also to a number of Indiana legislators as they're kind of coming into their role as a public official. So I would love to have you kind of share those four C's, kind of a filter for making tough decisions and leading. Yeah, well, um, they came out of the dilemma that I recognized uh, when I came in, uh, that you step, you think you have a pretty good picture of, and in my case, I thought I had all the answers when it came to politics, that's why I ran. Uh, and then I got elected to office and you realize just how much there is to learn. And of course, there's so many moving parts. Uh, people don't understand that on average in a short session, we have between 800 and 1,000 bills that are filed every short session. And in the long session, it's like 1,200 to 1,400 bills. And within each bill, there's a variety of, of considerations and different subjects and so forth. And it's just the sheer volume of it uh, is difficult to keep up with. And so one of my real concerns was, how am I going to be able to make the best decision I can make uh, with limited information and limited time and what feels like unlimited burden of responsibility? And I remember early on, God really gave me that download of what I call my four C's of decision making, which were the four grids through which I evaluate different decisions. And so, for example, uh, I'll often hear constituents say, well, you know, Senator Crane, now remember, now you represent all the people. And this was especially early on. I had campaigned as a conservative Christian Republican. And uh, yet in my district, which currently um, before the redistricting, we had 150,000 people in my district. And they represent a broad range of philosophical perspectives, religious perspectives, political perspectives, and so forth. And so people would say, well, now you represent all the people. And the idea being, you need to do what we tell you to do whenever we tell you to do it. And so it begs the question, well, what if I'm in a situation where what the constituents are asking me to do uh, violates some deeply held belief that I have? You know, theoretically, they're the boss and what am I supposed to just follow through, no questions asked, or how do I navigate that? And uh, so my four C's are, um, first of all, your core values or your, your beliefs of conscience, so your core values. In my case, my core values are firmly framed up according to the Christian worldview uh, and understanding what God has to say in his word to the best of my ability. And so to that end, there are certain non-negotiables that um, doesn't matter how much pressure there is to make a particular decision. If it's a non-negotiable based on a core value that I have, um, then you know, I've got to stand firm as best I can. And, and abortion is one of those because it's the cornerstone of, of everything else, in my opinion. Uh, so the first one is core values. The second one is the Constitution, which we are sworn to uphold, both the federal Constitution and our state Constitution. And so it's important for us as we're evaluating different issues to determine, you know, if there's any constitutional considerations that we have to factor in. The third is the constituents and the desires of the constituents and what they would have me do. And then the fourth is what we call the caucus. So people may not fully realize that uh, there is a majority caucus and a minority caucus in both the Senate and in the House. And because we are a Republican supermajority right now, the majority caucus is made up of Republicans and the minority caucus is made up of Democrats and that's both in the Senate and the caucuses in the House. And so oftentimes there'll be times where we have a discussion within the caucus and we say, hey, we've got to really stick together here on this issue and here's the reasons why. Well, where I can, I want to be a team player and, and have some level of loyalty uh, to my colleagues, but there are certain points at which um, I've had to deviate from what the caucus wanted because constituents wanted me to take a different approach or because there was a deeply held belief that I had. And so through those four C's of core values, constitution, constituents and caucus, they provide the lenses through which I make those decisions. And so what that helps me do is to recognize that at the end of the day, yes, I am answerable to my constituents. They were the ones that elected me to serve in this role. But ultimately I'm answerable to God and trying to be a good steward of what he would have me to do in this leadership role. And, and that's it. 
points where you get into some points of conflict there, but the goal is to try to do the very best you can to follow what God would have you do, and then factor in all the other variables along the way. It's not a, a perfect system, but it certainly has helped me in many, many occasions where there wasn't quite clarity on what the best path forward was. It's helpful, and I, I think of a number of, of listeners that may, be, may feel called to run for public life. And you, you know, it, it sounds great. You win your election, you get there the first day. Oh man. <laughs> and I sometimes do chuckle a little bit, just many times uh, public servants are taking the task for votes on one particular bill and, and we should focus on, on particular issues, but just on particular days, I'll see that in the Senate, you're dealing with everything from bioethics uh, to taxes, to the sanctity of life and to horse dentistry, <laughs> which I exactly. had a, uh, an interesting conversation about this session. Uh, and so there's a, there's a lot there. And so how do you, you filter through those? And I think of that first one, and I know that you encourage uh, that people follow their core principles or their conscience, um, regardless of kind of who they are there. I mean, this podcast is aimed at Christians. And I'm, I'm preaching on Sunday on the book of Daniel and in, on chapter six, which is the famous like Daniel in the lion's den. Uh, mm-hmm. We're doing a series called the Daniel Manual. One of the challenges is that everybody knows the story, but still it's this remarkable example of here's the, the emperor who wants to appoint him as kind of the secondhand man makes a rule. You can't pray to your God. Well, you know, Daniel just said, okay, uh, you can make that rule but I have a former and prior, uh, you know, ultimate allegiance that I'm going to go follow. Uh, so I see that as helpful. And then the, the constitution part of it, I think it, it pulls us back towards this concept of an ordered Liberty that we are a, a society of, we, we've set out rules and if you're going to change them, it shouldn't be just a judge coming up with something new. Um, but that we have a set of rules to follow and we need to actually abide by, the constitution. So have you had to have conversations with constituents saying, look, you know, here's what the constitution says. You're asking me to do this, but this is what I signed up and I, I sort of uphold. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the reality is I don't have to follow through on my, you know, my allegiance to the constitution if I choose to break that vow. Right. But if I take that vow seriously, which I do, then the constitution has to be a consideration where it becomes a challenge. And this is particularly true for folks who are on the right end of the, of the political or philosophical spectrum is they say, well, you know, we need to follow the constitution and say, yes, we do. But is the constitution, the ultimate authority, there are plenty of people that would say yes. And that's where I have gently tried to help them recognize that we interpret the constitution in light of scripture not scripture in light of the constitution, but scripture and God's word is the ultimate authority. I mean, we're having a huge conversation right now nationally about the issue of abortion. And I've heard, I've seen in uh, media reports, you know, the constitutionally protected right to abortion. So it's like, well, if the constitution theoretically says you have a right to abortion, does that mean that I should follow the constitution? I mean, I, I think the constitution doesn't give a woman that right. I think there's some, been some misinterpretation there. But my point simply is that the Constitution is not sacrosanct. It is not divine. Uh, it is a man-made document that is, is tremendously important. It provides the framework for the rule of law and the basic framework for civil society in the United States of America. But it is framed up according to principles that transcend the human experience, whether you're in the United States or any other country on the planet. And that is, what does God say on this or that issue? And so um, it's important for us to continue to think those things through and try to figure out, okay, how can we make the best decision in light of what God would have us do and also some of these other practical variables that might be in front of us when we have to make a vote on a particular issue and so forth. Um, because the other, the other big challenge, and I'll just throw this in real quick, is, um, you know, we get dinged all the time because we should have made this vote or that vote. Well, the reality is you have one choice between two options, yes or no. There might be 10 to 20 different variations between yes and no that would actually be much closer to where I would actually like to land on a particular issue. But that those options aren't afforded to me when I'm sitting at my chair on the floor of the Senate. I have to choose either yes or no on, on that particular bill that's in front of me. And that, 
that's difficult sometimes. It's very difficult to do when you're required to do it, but it's also very difficult for folks on the outside to kind of understand that. A couple of thoughts along those lines, and I can hear the the cries of you know Christian nationalism or something you know akin to that, saying, "Well, we interpret Scripture and then say, well, what is true, good, and beautiful, and then we come to kind of an analysis of the Constitution." But certainly, the Constitution didn't actually set out the people themselves necessarily as the the authority or source of those rights. It was saying, "Look, these are rights. We're just simply recognizing them," mm-hmm. um, and then that ultimate political authority in the American uh, Republic is uh, the we the people, mm-hmm. and I think it's an important distinction of we continue to look at what we have in the document. I mean, you, you think of the original uh, three fifths clauses that didn't uh-huh. recognize the full exactly. personhood of you know fellow image bearers. Yeah. Uh, so, like you said, it's not a it's not a perfect document. It's a, a solid document. It's uh, you think about all of the political documents throughout history, but this this framework is helpful. I think establishing what are those core principles back to the idea of being a statesman or a stateswoman um, mm-hmm. that's going to follow principle rather than just kind of the whim of public opinion, having kind of an ordered liberty, but then having your, your constituents say, here's what we, we think. And I, I will point out two pastors that red button and the green button uh, at, at your desk. We, as, as people in the general public, we get to argue and, and put our opinions in newspapers and all this stuff. But I've watched as people sit there and they're kind of, and then you get two choices. It's not a, let me think about this yeah. a little bit longer. It is, you have to actually vote and make a decision. Well, and, and not only that, but as I've shared with people, I'll be sitting, let's say at a coffee shop and we get into this whole conversation. And I say, one of the other uh, distinctions in my role is that everybody in this coffee shop probably has opinions on all the issues that I'm asked to weigh in on. It's just that they don't have to put their their opinion out for public consumption on the big board and then yeah. have everybody <laughs> critique what they should have done at that particular decision. Yeah, and it is literally like a scoreboard. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it goes exactly. up And it says, crane, <laughs> yes, yes or no. <laughs> That's right, exactly. So, so unless I wanna like, do a strategic bathroom break as soon as they take that vote and oh, they didn't get mine. You're you're required to have to make the decision given the options that are in front of you. And that's, uh, it's pretty frustrating to be honest with you sometimes, uh, many times, because it's like, man, this is not, like this isn't where I fully wanna go with this, but is it gonna take us a step closer in the right direction? That's, That's my hope with the things that we try to address. So we've talked a little bit through kind of core convictions, constitution, but then a, a bit on the constituents. Have there been times where you think, you know, I, I would prefer that something come out this way, but then you just kind of receive overwhelming communication from your district saying, no, we want to do this, but it's not implicated, you know, not a major moral issue, not clearly addressed by the constitution. And exactly. Just, yeah, exactly. I use an example. Um, the first year I was in, uh, it was the budget year. And um, we had to weigh in on the budget. And I had a number of people from the Avon School District that said, hey, please vote against the budget. We're trying to see if there's anything we can do to get a a little bit more funding and things like that. I mean, in reality, it's like stepping in front of the freight train. I mean, it's a the budget train is coming at you and you're going to step on the tracks and go, no, no, stop. (laughs) But they weighed in and they weighed in respectfully. And so um, I voted against it naively thinking that surely there'll be other Republicans that vote against the budget on this particular vote because there's any number of things that you could critique in the budget. I wa- There weren't. I was the only Republican <laughs> in that particular vote, and um, I took a lot of flack for it from certain people inside the institution. But the constituents really appreciated my willingness to take that, and that's one of the few votes that uh, on occasion people still talk about. Um, it didn't necessarily change anything in that particular sequence, but it did open the door for us to do some good work a little further along the road. Um, but yeah, there are times when you go, hey, I'm hearing from people. They want me to take this particular route, and I don't have any moral objections, a conscience objections. I don't. There's not a constitutional issue here uh, that's going to keep me from being able to do that. And absolutely, uh, we can do that. And I would say that generally... Um, what the constituents 
at least a lot of the ones I hear from would want me to do would be in line with what I would be inclined to do anyway. So it's not like there's always a lot of conflict there that you have to navigate. And that does lead us kind of to that last one. That is the caucus. And I imagine many Christians that, you know, maybe they're running for school board, maybe they're running for a state house race or Congress, and then they, they get there. And I hear this all the time. And you find out that there are these very powerful caucuses that are basically informing, you know, here's, here's the decision of leadership and you either get on board or we're not going to hear your bill. <laughs> and so there can be a lot of pressure brought yeah. to bear. And this is where I think a lot of, there's a lot of criticism of the process of politics. Certainly that's, that can be fair at times, but that's a reality that you have to navigate. And if you're trying to get a bill through, you have to talk to leadership and, and deal with perhaps their bill. Uh, so would you speak to that a little bit? How do you, you navigate yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, that's that right there is the crux of the issue. And it isn't just your caucus members. It's, it's the entire legislature, right? I mean, one of the questions that uh, I think every elected official, especially let's say in the, in the state house or at the federal level has to factor is do I, who do I represent? Do I represent just the people that voted for me? Do I represent only those that hold uh, kind of at least 90% of the same worldview that I hold? Or do I represent everybody in my, in my district and in, even in my state? And uh, the reality is you represent everybody. Now, how you go about that can become very challenging. But the reason why that matters is because it would be um, irresponsible, callous, and disrespectful for me to just casually dismiss anybody who disagrees with me outright. That would not be thoughtful. And I, I'm one that uh, promotes regularly this idea of thoughtfulness. And so I want to take people's ideas and perspectives into consideration. But at the end of the day, you have to make a decision. I had the opportunity uh, early on to go sit down with um, Mitch Daniels and uh, talk with him and, and just kind of get his perspective. And I said, hey, you know, how, how can I as a freshman legislator really make a difference? We had a great conversation and, and he talked about this whole idea of how do you get something done? You try to set the target out there and you just try to get as close to the center of the target as you can. Sometimes you get pretty close, most of the time you don't, and sometimes you don't even hit the target. What he didn't share in that moment and what I've come to understand since is that when you pull that that you're holding the bow and you pull the string back to shoot the arrow at the target, there's 150 other people that are pulling on that bow at the same time. And they're pulling in a variety of different directions. So you've got 149 other legislators in the House and the Senate and the governor. So that's 150 people that you have to convince a majority of them that your course of action is the right course of action. Nobody tells you that when you're on the outside. I mean, if you sat down and thought about it, you'd begin to recognize, wow, this might be a little tougher than I thought. But I've heard even this campaign cycle, you know, people who are running for office, when I get there, I'm going to make sure that we do this and I'm going to make sure we do that. And I'm going <laughs> to, I remember leaning over to a good friend of mine while listening to that and go, man, that is a great speech. I gave that same speech about six or seven years ago <laughs> when I was running. What I would love to do with that candidate is sit down with them and say, okay, I appreciate where you stand and I, you know, I'm aligned with you, but how well do you work with people, right? What would you say is your strength in terms of your ability to be able to influence enough people to get them to do what would be needed in order to move a bill forward? Are you okay with certain compromises or is every issue a hill that you're going to die on? And how do you figure that out? right? All these different things that are part and parcel to trying to persuade within a human dynamic where there are 150 or more personalities that you have to deal with to try to figure out how do we, how do, we do this? Because theoretically, every single legislator, leg, legislator is there because they want to serve the people. They want to do what's right. But the question becomes, okay, what is right? And how do we get there? And that's where we have a lot of spirit of debate. And then at the end of the day, you got to make that decision, yes or no, based on whatever it is that you have in front of you. So one of the distinctives of this podcast is who, who's doing the hard work of Christian citizenship? It's easy to sit behind a mic like we are today and 
kind of opined that somebody hasn't done their job and, you know, we haven't been strong enough on an issue. And, and certainly there can be fair criticism along those lines. But then you, you ask the question, okay, what are we going to do now? What are we going to do next? And so I appreciate your perspective is to those that are feeling led into this space, even those that are interacting with their own legislators, just you, to understand what they're thinking you know, what they're facing, you come in with your issue and say, you must do it this way. And then, like you said, they're trying to shoot the arrow and there's everybody's grabbing it. So I, I found at times as Christians come into the public square to interact with those that God has placed in positions of authority, we, we don't understand some of the nuances there, some of the complexities. doesn't mean that we compromise. doesn't mean that we, we stop pursuing what is good um, and right in the public square, but I think it's important to understand those. Um, since we do have a, a number of kind of new listeners this year, I was going to come back and just make one point fairly clear. I know, Senator Crane, we've talked about this before, but that in Scripture, we see the role of government as punishing evil, promoting good. But government is is a separate institution. It's ordained by God, but it's, in a sense, kind of morally neutral. It's Government doesn't define, it isn't the source of what is good or true. Rather, we believe that you know, well, whose version of, of good and evil is government supposed to be supporting or promoting? Well, it's, it's God's. That's the biblical model. Um, now, we do recognize we live in a plural society, and that the, the Imago Dei means that other image bearers will also be bringing their ideas into the public square. But I thought I would just mention that that's how we, we see that working out, and that plays Absolutely. into... Absolutely. I mean, that's know, the whole should we in. legislate morality issue. And I hear it from people, oh, we shouldn't legislate morality. And it's like, well, theoretically, yes, government should be kind of morally neutral um, in that sense. But in reality, it isn't a matter of whether or not we should legislate morality. It's simply whose morality are you going to legislate? Because that's where you get into worldview conflicts. And then you get into the day to day, just kind of political and, and policy debate on what is the right thing to do in a given situation. And because government is God's original design, then we look to God to say, okay, how do we define what is truly good and right, true and beautiful? And the way I've, I've tried to frame that for churches is the accusation against Christians a lot of times is, well, you're kind of selfishly legislating your own morality just because you want your own way. And I was just kind of like, no, if you're promoting biblical principles in the public square, then you're, you're promoting uh, God's principles or God's morality in an institution that he created. And we'd argue that that's what's best for all people. So just a, a quick note there. So those four C's are really helpful in trying to think through, kind of filtering through these different pressures and how do I prioritize which one. I want to move a little bit towards kind of political persuasion uh, for Christians. You, you think particularly of the life issue that is on everyone's mind with the leaked Supreme Court case. Theoretically, if, if Dobbs overturns Roe, it's throwing the issue back to the states. And, and so a lot of Christians are now looking at, okay, how, how could I go talk to a state legislator about this? So kind of the art of political persuasion, um, any thoughts on maybe what Christians do well, and then, you know, frankly, what Christians don't do well, and maybe we could do better at being persuasive in the public square? Yeah, well, I would say absolutely Christians need to be involved in the public square. That doesn't mean that every Christian needs to run for office, though we do need good Christian leaders in every level of government. Uh, but especially because we live in the United States of America, this democratic republic allows us and affords us the right and the freedom to be able to have a say. Uh, just a quick side note, I had the opportunity to give a tour through a group who are involved in a adult education program in Wayne Township. And uh, the, the group was probably about 12 to 15 adults from all kinds of other different countries. And I mean, it's countries all over the world that didn't have the freedoms that we had. And so we took them upstairs to the gallery, which is where the public can sit. And I told them, I said, this, this is one of the most important spaces in this entire capital, because this is where you, the public can come in and you can watch and you can engage with your elected officials. They were they they didn't believe me. <laughs> I said, yes, you can actually do that here. And it was fascinating because 
they had the perspective that we all need to have because they've come out of countries that are closed or where there are dictatorships or uh, communism or socialism or all these things that infringe on human freedom and dignity. And so here they come to the United States and they were just amazed that that is a possibility for anybody. And so because that is a possibility for all of us, uh, we not only have the opportunity, but I would say the obligation because uh, we get the elected officials that we vote or don't vote for, and we get the public policies that we don't engage on as much as the ones that we do engage on. Um, I will say in terms of those who, who want to engage with elected officials, it's a lot easier than people think. There isn't some secret handshake or some special code word that you have to use once you get into the state house. I mean, I have interacted with you, Josh, um, sometimes in formal ways where we've got a set meeting or I'm just going from one thing to the next and I've got an extra five minutes and always pop over to talk to whoever you have with you. And it's been average citizens, it's been pastors, a variety of different people who didn't know that day that they were gonna to get to meet Senator Crane. And we've had wonderful conversations. So there isn't some kind of secret formula. People don't realize that they could actually come down if they were so inclined and actually testify to actually let their voice be heard, to offer their perspective at a committee hearing. There isn't some you know, thing you have, some hoop you have to jump through to be able to do that. The challenge becomes, how do we temper our frustrations with the things that are happening in who we see as the big bad government that's the responsible for all the evils and ills in the world, how do we temper that in order to actually have thoughtful and meaningful interactions with our elected officials? Um, one of the concepts that I teach in a workshop that I give called uh, The Art of Political Persuasion is this idea that government is human. We tend to think of government as this disembodied bureaucratic machine somewhere out there that's making decisions of, about our lives. But the reality is that government is human. It is made up of men and women uh, who are just like you and me, who get up every morning, who have to take their kids to school, who have to buy the milk, go to the soccer practice, who put their pants on just like everybody else and drive to work just like everybody else, who have good days and bad days, who carry burdens and responsibilities, who lost loved ones and yet still have to show up and have interactions with people. I mean, it's, it's no different than anybody else other than the fact that we are more in the public eye and have a lot of people that are seeking our attention. And so if you realize that government is human, then it might change the way that you approach elected officials. Too many times we allow our frustrations to foster kind of a pitchforks and torches strategy. Where it's like, I am so angry about whatever this issue is. We need to just burn the place down, you know, and everybody goes, yeah, just tell me when. But the reality is that form of persuasion does not work. I mean, when you have, for example, protesters right now on the, on the properties of United States Supreme Court justices on this issue of abortion, what they don't realize is because those justices are human, that's probably not gonna work. In fact, if anything, it's going to, uh, they've overplayed their hand, but they don't even realize it because they've invaded privacy and they've decided that protesting in that way is appropriate. So what I tell people is to uh, replace the pitchforks and torches strategy with what I call the golden rule diplomacy. And that is starting with a posture of treating other people the way you would wanna be treated. If you do that, if you treat elected officials as real people, if you actually build a relationship with them, if you write them a note and just say, hey, thank you so much for your service. I really appreciate that. It's going to, it's going to begin to lay the groundwork for meaningful advocacy on issues that you care about. If you come at politicians on social media or in person, I mean, I've had, I've had people physically grab me because they were so fired up about something, you know, and it's like, Ma'am, I don't know if you realize this, but you're not helping your cause here, right? People come at you so hard because they're so frustrated. And I get it. I'm frustrated too. And I'm, I'm in a position to even try to do something to help the situation. But they don't realize that that's actually going to backfire. 
as opposed to coming at elected officials in a in a reasonable way, the way we would anybody else uh, in our daily interactions. And if you could build that relationship and come in with a spirit of collaborative solution seeking, like, hey, how can we work on this issue that we care about together? You're going to get a lot farther. Often have a Christian talk to me about, well, you know, we need to take a stronger stand on this. We need to be calling people out and perhaps God has given different people, different personalities and gifts. And, and there certainly are, you know, there's John the Baptist in the new Testament, but I have been surprised as I've been able to get to know a public servants better. I'd say it's, you know, if you want to pursue that, you can, I just don't think it's effective because I've been on the other side of that where someone shared with me, Hey, had, had a group come up and demand um, that I meet with them seven different times. And they screamed at me. And then I asked them if they had ever even read the bill and they said, no, and be completely discounted anything that that particular group had said. Now, if they're constituents, you got to listen to them, be gracious to them. Um, and so it's, it's not so much that, okay, you, you can't pursue that. Just like we have limited time and resources. Why don't we do something that's going to make a difference? Um, I did have this kind of follow-up question though. And, and I think of a, a situation uh, we had a uh, pastor, Steve Byers on uh, from West Lafayette. And West Lafayette attempts to pass this ordinance uh, that would have, have banned, quote unquote, gender uh, uh, conversion therapy. So that ministry doesn't practice it. And it, it would have basically barred parents and pastors talking about what the Bible says about human sexuality. It seems to me that their response was a strong one. And they, but they, and they weren't afraid to kind of call out some of those officials, but it was primarily done with facts. Um, so as a public official, you know, say somebody is going to stand up and they disagree with you strongly. Um, are there people that do that well? And is it more fact-based rather than, you know, Senator Crane hates all people or something? Right. Um, what are your thoughts there? Well, and I think facts are always important. Uh, the challenge becomes whose facts are you going to listen to, right? Quote, unquote, facts, because everybody brings their, quote, facts. It's kind of like with the COVID thing, follow the science and then at some point you go, who's science? Because all the experts are saying things that run the entire spectrum of how we should approach COVID. So that's a challenge. But I think it's really important to bring facts. I think it's even more important to not wait until the issue becomes a hot button issue to have been building a relationship with those elected officials. You can get more done over one lunch with somebody that's in a key decision making position because of this cultivation of relationship that you've had with them to actually move that needle, then you will showing up at a, you know, school board hearing, town council meeting, a, you know, Senate hearing and sharing your perspective. I think it's important to do that. Don't hear me say otherwise. Uh, we absolutely should have people speaking up. And I think it's important to speak truth to power. The question becomes, what is the most effective way to share truth with those in power. That's the challenge. And in my experience, both in terms of people who've come to me or in times where I've tried to move the needle on something, I find that it's because I have that relationship with whoever that decision maker is, that I can say, hey, you know what? Um, I'm a little concerned about this. It feels like this particular piece isn't gonna get us where we wanna go, but hey, what if we did this instead? So I'm coming with a collaborative solution seeking, you know, agreement there that we can both kind of agree on. I found that if I take that approach, um, I'm going to, I'm going to get so much farther on the issues that I care about than if I come in and even just unload a bunch of facts on somebody. That relational piece is really, really important, but it's also the hardest thing because it's time intensive. Um, it takes effort. But I'm telling you, there are people right now that hold no formal leadership role that have more influence in that capital than folks that uh, have come in with some leadership role or especially folks on the outside that are leveraging their platform saying, hey, we need to you know, do this or that. So I think it's a combination of both. I think truth matters, but I think it's, it's um, better suited for influence when it's couched in, in that relational capacity. And I appreciate your example and that I've observed is you've had people that have a different ideological perspective on something like marriage 
uh, come at you very hard and yet you continue to build relationships with them and it it becomes a disagreement about the issue but not a criticism of the person themselves you know and, mm -hmm. and i think maybe that's another key but well it's interesting that. because yeah. we we view those who oppose us as the enemy in fact i i was having kind of a conversation at a home one time last fall a lot of you know, local parents were fired up about what was happening in schools. And so one of these kind of organic parent groups was coming together and they asked me to come in and just help them think some things through. And I said, you need to understand that the person sitting across the table from you is not the enemy. And they go, well, then who's the enemy? And I said, well, it's bad ideas, right? John Stone Street of the Colson Center said that uh, ideas have consequences and bad ideas have victims. And so if you understand that the enemy is actually ignorance and the enemy is actually a bad idea that's not going to promote the things that are good, true, and beautiful, then I can hopefully begin to extrapolate the issue itself from the person who's carrying it. I have, I have empathy towards people who are presenting bad ideas, not because I agree with the idea. It's because to me, uh, there's some bit of information that they don't understand that's caused them to land you know, at a certain place on that issue. And if I can help be an agent of education, lovingly, but with truth, then hopefully I can help convince them that maybe there's a different way to look at that issue. You mentioned to me a development, and we're seeing this really across the country, and I wanted to get your opinion on it. And the, basically the idea is, most, I think most Christians are familiar with the concept of, of the lemon test, and you have, in a sense, secular humanism, that's kind of dressed up as, as neutral, even though it is, in a sense, a religion itself. It's quasi-religious, mm -hmm. at least. And, and so people kind of bringing in their morality and saying, well, it's just secular humanism. It's actually neutral, and so it can be applied in the public square. Well, well now you have a different argument, which in some ways it kind of welcome because it, it actually just shows, let's, let's not even act like it's neutral anymore. But I, I would frame it as kind of the rise of the religious left. And that you have, you know, many are familiar with the religious right, uh, but you have individuals coming in to speak on more contro controversial issues, like issues affecting transgenderism or life, and them coming in saying, well, here's what the Bible says about this issue, and it's okay. You know, it, uh, we should love our neighbors, and that means we must affirm those sorts of statements. And that in some of these hearings, there haven't been many pastors uh, from what I would consider more orthodox, you know, pastors that believe in the authority of scripture. Uh, we just did a podcast recently on how to respond to transgenderism and dug into all that, but you don't have those pastors coming in to say, well, actually, that's not what God says. Um, and so this fascinates me with kind of the rise of the religious left, and it seems to me to be more than a public policy issue, because as people showing up in the public square saying, this, thus says the Lord, and it would be important for pastors, if for no other reason, to stand up and say, no, that's not what God says, and this is what we believe God says. Mm -hmm. uh, so would you explain a little bit of that development and how you're responding yeah. to it? I mean, and I, I don't know that it's a, it's a new thing. I mean, I think that there's been um, conflict of ideologies even within the church for a long time. Um, I would say maybe perhaps uh, certain members of the self-proclaimed progressive wing of the church um, are a little more emboldened because of where the culture is. And conversely, I think those who support more of an orthodox view um, have shied away from it. And maybe it's because we bought in too much to this, you know, quote unquote, separation of church and state. And we're not, you know, allowed to say anything, nor should we. We should just focus on evangelism and the gospel and the good news. And uh, my counter to that as a former pastor is that I think we have focused on evangelism, which is excellent, you know, salvation but also discipleship. What does it mean to walk by faith, to follow Christ, to, to uh, model our lives after his? And where does that extend into every aspect of our life? Or is there some boundary where we say, well, I follow Christ up to this point, but everything beyond that point is the secular world. And we create that sacred secular divide. And so, you know, you were referencing certain committee hearings. We had one on the fairness of women's sports bill, this, uh, bill that's gotten a lot of attention. The governor ultimately vetoed it, and we're going to be coming in, I think, here in a couple of weeks, um, hopefully to override the veto. But I happened to preside over that 
committee hearing. And what people don't realize is that during committee hearings, on average, you have about five to 10 people that show up to testify. This one, we had 45 people come to testify. Uh, the entire Senate chamber where the education committee meets, uh, the floor upstairs in the gallery and out in the hallway was jam packed with uh, folks that were opposed to this bill. And of the 45 people that came to testify, there were three members of the clergy that came to testify. Uh, they were part of the 40 people that came to oppose the bill. There were only five people that came in support of the bill. One was um, representation from the attorney general's office. One was a lawyer with Alliance Defending Freedom who uh, someone flew in from out of state. I think maybe IFI helped with that. Um, he testified. There was a father from Morgan County who came in and a mother from Hamilton County who came in. And then the fifth person was actually a transgendered female. So it was a biological male uh, who identifies as a female who came in and said, I do not think that biological males should be competing in female sports. As you might imagine, this person had the most authority to be able to speak to the prevailing crowd. But to your point, the three members of the clergy who came in, came in and gave their understanding of the quote unquote divine endorsement of, you know, being your authentic self, right? If you feel like your, your gender is not what you were born with, then you have every right to determine that. After all, God loves you and wants the very best for you. That was the, that was the general message. What we did not have during that hearing was any member of what I would consider to be kind of the, the orthodox Christian conservative leadership movement in our state or nation coming in and providing the alternative. We didn't have pastors. We didn't have Christian leaders even attempting. And I'm not saying it's easy. It's very, very difficult. But it's necessary because otherwise what you have is not only an impartial understanding of the whole picture, but a twisted understanding of the whole picture. And it's presented as if it is the whole and it is the healthy approach to how we should address that issue. And it's not uncommon to have a similar representation on other issues of, of that magnitude that have certain theological implications. So uh, there is a huge opportunity, we'll, we'll call it a huge opportunity to be able to come in and to provide some of that. And I would just say to any of your listeners out there, I meant to say this earlier in terms of any of the elected folks that may be interested in, in running for office. If any of your listeners are interested in running for office or any of the pastors are interested in saying, okay, I hear you and I, I do wanna do better, and I, but I'm just not sure what to do. Have them get in touch with me. I would be happy to meet with anybody who is interested in trying to enter into this particular mission field because uh, we've got some good folks in there, but uh, it is oftentimes a dark place, and, and we certainly need more uh, representation of the light. And so I have uh, thought long and hard uh, after you shared that with me, uh, because again, it's it's not just a discussion about public policy. It's a discussion about what God says, and again, back to the church's role of kind of morally informing, in a sense, the conscience of the state. Um, the church is the conscience of the state, but for, you know, morally informing the state what's good, true, and beautiful, as we've discussed, and there, there being no one there to say, here's what, what the Bible says. That, that is different in kind than I just disagree with the policy. Um, it's something that I've thought a lot about. Well, I know we're, we're coming up uh, close to your hard stop, and so I kind of have a blitz round here. Uh, yeah. first, first blitz question, uh, a lot of people are thinking about the, the life issue uh, with the leak yeah. of the Dobbs uh, draft opinion. Um, so legislators all over the country are thinking about what happens if this comes back to the state. Um, so as a state legislator in Indiana, do you have kind of a quick update on what's going on in that area? Yeah, obviously a lot of people are watching this. I think um, there have been some serious missteps at the national level. The fact that this draft memo was even leaked is a serious problem. The fact that you have protesters on the lawns of justices and the chief justice, serious problem. But I think it's because everybody realizes that there is a lot at stake. One of the uh, misconceptions, especially from the pro-life groups, are believing that once this Supreme Court decision is made, assuming that it does overturn Roe v. Wade, 
then abortion will be outlawed across the land, and that is not the case. What it simply will do is it will bring the issue back to the states. So even now, many forward-thinking leaders in Indiana and in other states around the country are beginning to position themselves to be ready for that, to take action. And uh, our leadership in the legislature, um, Speaker Houston, Todd Houston, and also uh, Senate Pro Tem uh, Senator Rod Bray put together a joint letter and asked any members in the legislature if they wanted to, to sign it. It was addressed to the governor. And so I and the vast majority of my Republican colleagues in the Senate signed that letter, essentially asking him, the governor, to um, institute a special session as soon as possible uh, once that decision is made so that we can come in and take action on protecting life in Indiana. Um, I'm not exactly sure where that is in terms of uh, how that's going to play out. And obviously, we're all kind of waiting to get the official decision from the court. But uh, we're, we're eagerly looking forward to the opportunity to be able to do this. It's, uh, I was born in 1973. And so this issue of abortion has been wedded to my life for the last 49 years. And uh, it would be absolutely monumental if we can take some action in Indiana to try to protect the most vulnerable among us. Because as I tell people often, we can't fight for the rights of any individual on any issue if they aren't first given the right to life. That's why it's so fundamental and such a cornerstone issue for us. And so last kind of blitz question, and I'm grateful for your, your stance there. And also you've done a lot of work on helping the church get out and, and serve those in the community, maybe vulnerable uh, young mothers and trying to help them through various efforts. We've, we've talked a little bit about that before. So you don't, you see this holistically and I appreciate that. Um, kind of last one, you, you work in the worldview space in a sense through Sagamore and then the Colson Center. We talk a lot on the podcast about that, you know, maybe 6% of American Christians have a biblical worldview. So if you had maybe just one or two things to share you know, what are, what are you focused on? What are you seeing that's working right now that church leaders, other committed Christians should know? Yeah, well, you're, you're hitting the, the heart of where my focus is. Obviously, politics is important, but as we often say, politics is downstream from culture, and everybody nods their head. I've had very few people ask the next question, which is, what is upstream from culture? And what is upstream from culture is this clash of worldviews. Um, we talked earlier about secular humanism. You think about Christian, the Christian worldview, secular humanism. I think those are kind of the two big heavyweights in this uh, smorgasbord of worldviews. And really, it gets down to uh, the most important verse in Scripture, which is Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, that uh, that is the pivot point for everything else. It's either in the beginning God created or in the beginning God did not create. And everything else stems from that. And so um, when I think about what we can be doing, obviously being involved in politics matters. It really does. And as I've said earlier, even on this conversation, we need good leaders who are in the political mission field. But I think the most important thing, and this is what I share with anybody who's willing to listen, the most important thing that we can do if we are concerned about the cultural trajectory that we're currently on, especially not just for us, but for the next generation, the thing we can do is get serious about developing a robust Christian worldview discipleship training strategy, both within the church and within our educational institutions, particularly Christian schools and such. Because once we understand Christian worldview in the context of daily discipleship, then, you know, if we raise up children to understand that, then those become the next leaders that we have in all of these different cultural spaces, in politics, in technology, in medicine, in the arts, you know, all these different areas of cultural influence. It's easy to say we need to get serious about discipleship, but the reality is we need to get serious about discipleship. We're, we talk all the time about we need to have you know, conversations that are focused on civility, and we need to be able to get people together and talk through these things. Well, where is that happening? I mean, there's certain places where it is. I think the Colson Center is convening some of those, which is excellent. Uh, one of my former uh, fellow Colson uh, fellows during the 2004 program is Gabe Lyons. He's doing some great stuff with Q. But generally speaking, how our church is doing at being a convener 
even within their church, of places where you can actually wrestle this stuff through in kind of that safe environment where you don't feel like you're going to just automatically be lambasted because you don't understand something, or maybe you take a little different approach, but have somebody in there who is wise, who is biblically grounded, who can facilitate that kind of conversation. We have that all the time. We had a fantastic conversation last night with our Sagamore leaders about this whole issue of abortion and whether or not they think uh, that protesters should show up on the lawns of Supreme Court justices. And it focused in on a variety of different issues there. We talked about progress. We all want progress, C.S. Lewis said. But how do we define it? Well, it depends on what your starting point is and where you're trying to go and things like that. Where are the places where we're having those conversations? Where are the places where we are developing what I would call a theology of political engagement? Because God does have a few things to say about that, right? Um, if the church isn't talking about it, then nobody else will be, other than this attempt on social media to try to have some kind of public forum free-for-all, which I have been the recipient of, and it's not entirely thoughtful, nor is it very <laughs> productive. And yet we need to actually have those places. So to me, uh, trying to actually put feet on this concept of developing a robust Christian worldview discipleship training strategy, it is absolutely essential. Uh, the church that we're involved in, Connection Point Christian Church in Brownsburg, right now is laying the groundwork for building a worldview discipleship center at their church. It is unbelievable. And I'm not even sure that there's any other church that I'm aware of that's even attempting something like that. So I see little signs that are encouraging to me, um, but we've got a long way to go because um, our efforts aren't keeping up with the speed of cultural deterioration. Wow, there's so much there. And I'd say, amen, discipleship is, is the name of it. And I'm hearing that from a lot of church leaders. So I'm sure that's you know a welcome idea. It's just, how do you do it? Uh, yeah. Because the forces that are kind of coming against not only us, but those in Gen Z, as we've talked about before, yeah. are, are so seductive, so powerful. Um, well, and that's and that's what I say. I mean, I'm glad to hear that you're having more of those conversations. I am as well. And I'll just put this out there again. If, you are, if you're having conversations with pastors or any of your listeners or leaders that recognize this and are going, yeah, you know, we do. And it would be valuable for me to come and speak to your folks or to consult in some way. Uh, you you are preaching my language. That is right at the heart of where we need to be spending our time. So I'd be happy to help in whatever way I can. Well, we appreciate your work there. Uh, I think of being kind of thoughtful, uh, being smart, but strategic in our role in public life. And so I appreciate your example of that in the Indiana, in the Indiana Senate. Uh, so you mentioned a couple of times how people might get connected with you. Uh, you yeah. do a great seminar on the art of political persuasion, where you can go into the, all of this. And when people um, ask me about what kind of experience you have in, in politics, I'll often tell them, well, I was in church leadership for 10 years. So exactly. church leaders might benefit from the art of political <laughs> persuasion just a little hey, bit. I, I had huh? somebody tell me the exact same thing that my time as a pastor was a great uh, training ground for getting into politics, and they were exactly right. <laughs> Absolutely. So how, as we close, how can um, listeners get connected with you and learn more about your work? Sure. Well, the best thing to do would be to just uh, reach out through my website. It's craneleadership.org, and uh, that'll give a way for people to connect with me. I've got an assistant that helps us coordinate all that stuff, and You'll see some links on there that link to my Senate page and what we're doing with Sagamore and some of the other things that we're doing. Um, so craneleadership.org is the best way to reach out. And again, um, I, I want to help whoever wants to be helped. And uh, I think that felt need is just going to grow as we see the cultural trajectory continue in the direction that it is. So it's time for us all to lock arms and try to do what we can to help each other out in that way. Amen. We well, appreciate you taking some time with us today, and we'll we'll get this out to listeners. Have those linked in the show notes, and looking forward to continuing the conversation and, and working with you. That's awesome. Thanks so much, Josh. It's always a pleasure to be on with you.